guys, today I'm in Southern California. I came out here to introduce you to my friend Tony Soros and to teach you about paddle and anvil pottery. In the ancient Southwest, there were two ways that pottery was manufactured. The first was coil and scrape. That's the way I usually make pottery. And that was practiced by the ancestral Puebloan or Anazazi potters and the Mogollon potters. But in the western part of the Southwest, over here in California and in Western Arizona, pottery was made using the paddle and anvil method. Now there's not many replicators today working with the paddle and anvil method. And one of the best is Tony Soares, who lives here in California. So today I caught up with him at his home and he talked to us about how he got into pottery and also showed us how to make paddle and anvil pottery. I think you're really gonna get something out of this video. My grandmother got me started playing with clay when I was about five years old, which would have been around 1974, 1975, um, making just some little simple, like uh, petals on a sunflower, and uh, kind of sparked my interest in clay. I was into birds and eggs, so the egg shape was there that I really was fascinated with and bird nests that were made out of mud and wasp nests, uh, like swallow nests and wasp nests. And those were the things that kind of triggered in my mind for clay and pottery. And, and I started to get into little pinch pots. My grandma had learned how to make pottery in, a, in college, but uh, uh, she you know, got, me, got me going at, at a really young age. So I started out with a little bit of clay dust on my This just keeps uh, the new clay from dehydrating or from sticking to the pot. Yeah. Took me a long time to figure this one out. And you could pound it out on a table. But I want to get this thing as thin as you can. So you could thin it out with your hand, or if you got hands that aren't as uh, sledgehammer like, you can use a and build it, kind of hammer it out. And the clay Burn. dust is the same clay that the, uh, you know, that the other clay is, the same, the same source? Uh, this stuff is pachanga brownware, yeah. I... <clears throat> 18 or 19, maybe I tried it at 16, and I just wasn't getting the you know, it was the pot, the clay was sticking to the form. And I had to think on it for a while. And I remember my grandma always putting the flour down on the kneading board and that kept the, the dough from sticking to the kneading board. And this is my anvil stone. One side is kind of flat and the other side is round. One of these days I gotta finish pecking this thing out. And I've seen a few of these from around here uh, in the Joshua Tree area or the central, like the Valley Temecula area. They found some really nice little pottery anvils. A bit. I'll use a little bit of water. You don't have to, you could use uh, some of the clay dust on there. Double check on that, still got a nice release on there. Folks out here really didn't polish their pottery, but they they were smooth, but they almost had more of a patina. Uh, probably about the time I was 12 or 13, I started finding my own clays and just testing them a little bit because I knew, you know, the, the, the native peoples that were living here in the deserts of California weren't getting their clay at, at a store. So 
I got into looking for clay and I was big into hiking. And then uh, I could tell the difference between some of the old shards that, that were laid on the desert floor compared to the commercial clay. The commercial clay didn't have any temper in it, no sand or anything. And some of the shards had all these really cool little layers of color. And that was very intriguing to me because you couldn't really get that in a in a electric kiln. We were getting a little bit of that in the charcoal firing, but commercial clay didn't seem to do that. But once I found some clay that I could pinch out and it had the right texture and it looked a lot like some of the old shards that laid around out here in the desert, I uh, was kind of, I was sold on the, the whole thing. I love to play with fire and if I could cook something in it and get something out of it that was forever, uh, I just thought it was a really, really cool thing to to do and uh, you know growing up out in the desert there's nothing really to do but play army all day and hike around hunt lizards and that kind of stuff but pottery was a lot of fun a little flimsy but this is what I way I kind of do it and the clay kind of gets a little dehydrated so it some clays get a little cracky, so you can just smooth those out. With it. You can use a sharper tool in the so some of the old pots you know, they found out here have a, a basket impression so they're using a, a pookie a basket pookie probably sitting right on their lap while they made mm -hmm. I'm sure it was very similar out here too back in the day just kind of kneeling down over the pot so I'm going to start applying my coils and I just split the difference. I put the coil on, on the side away from me. And I just roll it on with my thumb. Smear it, smear it on so it's welded really well. And looking at some of the old pots uh, where they didn't obliterate their coil all the way on the inside, it looked like they were using coils about well, three quarters to an inch thick in mm -hmm. most cases. Make sure that that seam is welded. And you can use an anvil stone or the pottery one. But I use a little bit of water, nothing dripping off. I use the back side of my paddle usually. And do all the heavy work with that. So as your clay starts to get sticking to the paddle, you want to every once in a while just kind of scratch it off and uh, get that off because sooner or later you're going to hit it and it's going to pull a chunk out. You could do this more towards the end too. You can hammer up a whole bunch of coils and then put the volume back in it. I think uh, when I started to get pretty good at it, I did take a course down in Chihuahua, Mexico from the Nicholas Casado, brother of famous Juan Casada, and uh, learned the Mato Ortiz style pottery and how they were making their stuff. and. I think that kind of helped me refine my stuff because I hadn't really met any potters other than a, a couple of potters that were, you know, wheel throw, throwing pottery. And I thought I was going to go that route, but uh, it just 
I just didn't like the whole commercial aspect of it. And uh, but uh, the Mato Ortiz pottery was was really neat. It was a neat course to take, and that kind of taught me how to teach pottery. I think more than anything, and uh, so that kind of spilled over when I do all my classes. I still think back from when I was at that and how Nicholas Casada taught his class and conducted it. It was, you know, quite quite a good class. This clay's a little on the soft side. I made this for a class a couple of weeks ago and when I teach uh, the students, I usually have the clay a little softer because it dries out so fast and we're usually outside and the wind's blowing. And a little pottery anvil. And one thing that a lot of people overlook is they'll just bam, 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 and then your anvil's stuck. Mm -hmm. So you gotta do give it a little twist. If you don't give it that twist, and, I'll, and you see I'll be rocking this thing back and forth like that, that's just helps it release each time. Sit there and pinch out a pot this big just with your hands and all this scraping it. It could take a little while doing it. Like, sure. This way it's just a little quicker to me. And I love doing all the pinch and coil and scraping and all that stuff. But uh, a lot of times I don't have the time to do that. So I hammer out stuff as fast as I can do. This area seems to be a little on the dry side. So anytime they get start getting dry and a little crunchy looking, they'll just like a lot of the pots out here were small necks and uh, they'll find lids on them and there'll still be some seeds or beans mm -hmm. or different things inside looks so cool so the water can drip through and hold the round bottom pot the whole nine years. Super important, weld that. <clears throat> now you're controlling the shape as you're paddling as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all directional. Every so often, recenter. I'll just put my hand. I have seen this impression on some of the pots. Just a little bit of the, the knuckle. If your pot starts to crack down here, either your clay is was not very good or your clay was still wet. So you gotta always keep an eye on it. this clay hardly does it, but let's see, so I learned all this paddle and anvil technique. I did see a picture of a Papago Indian pottery woman making pots and she just had a little layout a couple of pots were upside down I think one was right side up a paddle and an anvil and I knew that all the pottery out here was made by paddle and anvil because I, I guess read it in a book or something and uh, similar shapes and stuff so I uh, copied the tools and practiced the technique and before long I got pretty good at it and then Years went by where I'd been making these things and found a book on pa uh, Papago Indian pottery. It was written, I forget when it was written, a long time ago, 50s or 40s or something. And, and all the stuff, all the photographs in there confirmed everything that I had, was doing was correct. The way they 
pretty much did everything. So I was really excited. Once I found that book, it would have shaved a lot of uh, time off of the learning curve for me had I found that book at an early age. Yeah, make a lot of different types of pottery, but Southern California stuff is my favorite. The shape, not super intricate design stuff, but I do like all that early Pueblo stuff and South American stuff. I did some Mayan pottery, membrane pottery, even some Peruvian style pots. and anvil stuff is what calls to me the most. I've been making these paddle and anvils like this for at least when did I, probably like 1988 was when I really started making more paddle and anvils. Before that I was just doing a lot of pinch and coil and scrape. Mm -hmm. So you got to get the right clay and Everything has to be mixed right. I think a lot of it was mixing the clay right and the right colors and where you're digging it. Uh, but I had messed with the, the river clay years ago and as a kid I mentally put in my mind where I saw clay along the river and years later once I was able to drive, uh, probably about 16, 18 years old, I started going back to these places where I made that mental note and, and digging some of the, the clay along the river and trying to process it and see what it could do in a fire. And, and, I, and I think one of the, the greatest hurdles in some of the clays that I was using was preheating. Um, took a long time to learn that with the commercial clay and then finding some of the, the clays out here in the desert. Most of them you could heat up fairly quickly. There was a few that would pop and then uh, then when I you know, found some of this, this brown clay, it, you can almost fire it wet in some cases, or if you mix a, enough sand dune sand in the clay, you could fire your clay wet. My great aunt would take us from uh, all around the southwest. We'd go to Mesa Verde, all the different ruins, and uh, just go to the museums, and I was always fascinated with all the pots and the shapes, and I've always been attracted to this egg shape. I was into birds too for some reason as a kid and, and beehives and uh, wasp nests. I'd like to make wasp nests, the mud dauber nests along the Colorado River. I always thought it was really cool. Mm -hmm. and build those right on the, in the trees next to all the drunk people walking around partying and uh, fake them out with the mud dauber nests. Lately I've been using a scouring pad just to kind of drag the clay up a little bit. It works really well, as long as you don't get it too wet. Let's see, I started teaching, it was 1992 or 93 for Agua Caliente Cultural Museum. And just, man, mostly hit up all the reservations are my biggest clients for, for teaching. So I, I stay busy with a lot of those folks. If somebody was interested in learning from you, what would be the best way to get a hold of you about that or sign up for a class? It would probably hit me up on my email. I've been promising everybody I was going to teach teach classes. I've been teaching at Idlewild Arts oh, for about 12 years now, but um, I'm going to start teaching now that COVID's over. I'll start teaching here at the house again uh, some classes, do a little bit of paddle and anvil. I can only do like five people at a time. Uh, maybe if we did an outside class, I'd get a few more people, but I like to stay connected with everybody's stuff, especially when you're working outside. Uh, things dry out real quick. You got to stay on them.
There's a little piece of wood I picked up out of the yard, nothing special. All very low tech stuff. On this side. Smooth that out a little bit. I'm sure the old folks had some little wooden tools or bone tools that they preferred to use, but the paddle works in many ways. Yeah, it was about an hour build time that took 45 years of figuring out, but okay. once, once you... I just, there's something about, I don't know what it is, I mean, I, I live like a hunter-gatherer in the modern world, I mean, sure, I like to make money, and there's a lot of times where I don't make any money at doing what I do, and you know, starving artist syndrome, but uh, I just keep doing it because that's what I love and there, if there's one person that I teach in one of my classes that wow this is cool whether it be a youngster or an elderly person and they love it and they can identify with it say like out on, along the Colorado River you know you still got Mojave people out there they live on the river and and maybe they've drifted away from the pottery but when they see it they identify with it hey this is me you know, and if I could bring that back to somebody, it's just like, woo, that's so cool. And just kind of but yeah, that's that's about what a, a pot looked like out here. And as it sets up a little bit more, a lot of times they come back in and get rid of any of that little squattiness that was there. But not always. Some of them they left a little squat on there. Good enough for now. Beautiful. I hope you enjoyed that video, meeting Tony Soares and learning about paddle and anvil pottery. He also teaches workshops, so if you're interested in paddle and anvil pottery, you should think about that. I'll put a link to where you can learn more about his pottery workshops down in the doobly-doo. Also, check out and subscribe to his YouTube channel. I'll put the link to that right up here. And if you want to see another video where I'm talking to another legend in Southwest Pottery Replication, I'll put the link to that right over here. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.